Let's open with prayer as we begin, please. Father, good afternoon. We're back. We're back for more of you. We're here to worship. We're here to dig into your scripture. We're here to hear you speak. May what you tell us uh, come through us with clarity and understanding where that what it is you want us to know. We understand and then we step out boldly and be bolder and more effective witnesses for you. Thank you for the opportunity we've got to, to move through this study verse by verse. Thank you for what you're doing in our individual lives and in the body of Christ as we gather every Sunday night. We give you praise. We give you our worship. And it's all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, a couple of handouts. There is one little one back there on the table uh, by Sandy. Uh, she is gardener. And the fee is nominal, she said. They're up, they're gone. And the other one is one that, that uh, Pam did. Uh, she took my black and white chart last week and colorized it. I, I told her I have a color one, I just wasn't going to run 30 copies of color. So, uh, but she's going to do that. So uh, showing the, the uh, Ham and Shim and Japheth on the, on the chart. So those are the the two handouts that we have tonight. Uh, last week, we ended with the opening three verses of chapter 12, where we saw Abram, he's not Abraham yet, a man of faith uh, called by God uh, and given a covenant. Uh, we briefly looked at God's call and the promises that Abram heard uh, in Ur, uh, from God. So I'm not going to go back through these verses, but that will familiarize you with where we were at the end of class and where we're starting tonight. Also, you should remember this chart as we looked at uh, to start <coughs> class last week depicting the various stages of the book of Genesis uh, and their emphasis. Noting, of course, as you see on the chart here, Genesis chapters 1 through 11 covered the four key events from creation to the Tower of Babel and the confusing of languages and then the scattering of man. Right there you see at the timeline between chapter 11 and 12. In chapter 12, which we started last week with the call of Abram and all the way through chapter 50, uh, that primarily is dealing with people as opposed to events. Four uh, key people from Abram through Joseph. Uh, I, I can also point out that chapters 1 through 11 are set in Babylonia, Babylon. <coughs> chapters 12 through 36 uh, with Abram are set in Palestine. And when we get up to chapter 37 and the start of the life of Joseph all the way through 50, uh, that's set in Egypt. Uh, in other words, each part of the Mediterranean world is highlighted uh, in some part of Genesis. Uh, if we try to break down the progress through this book chronologically, uh, the commentaries note that the book moves us progressively from generation, chapters 1 and 2, to degeneration, the fall of man, chapters 3 through 11, uh, and then to regeneration, chapters 12 through 50, uh, with a special emphasis, of course, on God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. Now that we're in chapter 12, our focus is going to be on the promises of of pros prosperity, posterity, P-O-S-T-E-R-I-T-Y. Uh, that is an heir, a seed. We're looking at the seed line. Uh, through the other promises, um, also we're going to be looking at, uh, but, but the seed line is really the one that receives the majority of the attention. And in order to provide the blessings promised to Abram, <laughs> Uh, God had to overcome many obstacles. I've given you the little chart of the 12 obstacles that Abram encountered in his faith journey, just sort of a, a, a 
tool to save so as we get to them, you can say, all right, we're at number three or four or five. Each obstacle, though, provided an opportunity uh, for Abram to grow stronger in faith, uh, and each one, in turn, tested his faith uh, in some way. So where we are now in chapter 12 through chapter 25, we're going to be looking at the problems of possessing the land, because he struggled with that, and obtaining an heir uh, dominate. Uh, the, the, the story we're going to be looking in Abram's life. Uh, one writer called the form uh, in which Moses revealed Abram's story uh, an obstacle story. And that's really where I got the little chart of 12 things. 12 crises arise as the story of Abram's life unfolds. Uh, each of these must be overcome and in fact is overcome uh, through the power of God, uh, who eventually does provide yeah. Abraham some descendants. So that's, that's how we get to where we're going. Uh, ending last week with God's call to Abram and God's promises of the covenant in verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, now let's go ahead and move to see what Abram does in response to the call and in response to the promises, picking up in verse 4. <clears throat> so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moray. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. In response to God's call to depart, Abram leaves Ur uh, and then he leaves Haran, uh, in Acts chapter 7, verse 4, as I noted last week, Stephen told us that Abram waited until his father died before leaving Haran and continuing to Canaan. Uh, when you look at the verse, the way it is textually worded and written, it almost looks like um, that is not the way it occurred. So that's why the Acts account helps us with Stephen's uh, recount there. We might hesitate at this moment and ask whether Abram was fully obedient to God's call to lead his relatives and his father's house. Uh, and first, we know he took his father with him from Ur to Haran. Uh, and he took his nephew Lot all the way to Canaan. Since Lot voluntarily, uh, so it seems, chose to accompany Abram, uh, he probably believed the, the promises uh, as well as Abram. <clears throat> Abram's call, if you remember, uh, had been to separate from his pagan relatives. Now, was Abram wrong to bring these men along, Terah, his father, and Lot, his nephew? Uh, and the short answer, of course, is no. Uh, in the case of his father, Terah, uh, likely it was Abram who persuaded his father to accompany him uh, and who then naturally, as the patriarch, uh, became the leader of the family, the leader of the party. Uh, Abram could not have stopped Terah uh, if he had tried. However, since Terah was the, the, the eldest and the patriarch, uh, and Abram would have had no authority in that day uh, over his father anyway. More importantly, Abram, if you remember, was following God's call of escorting Terah back to his ancestral home. Remember what Stephen said in Acts 7 verse 3 uh, which I read to you last week 
uh, and said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are now living. God directed Abram to move on to Canaan only after his father died. God was permitting Abram to fulfill his duties uh, as a son to his father, uh, caring for Terah uh, until he died. Now, the case of Lot, a little bit different. Uh, the answer is less clear uh, in, in looking at the commentaries, although it appears that Lot went voluntarily, uh, indicating if he was going to take this journey, he probably believed the promise. Uh, Abram had likely become Lot's provider. Uh, when Lot's father, Haran, died, if you recall, uh, if so, uh, Abram could no more leave Lot behind uh, than he could leave his wife, Sarah. So it would be expected for Abram to bring Lot with him to Haran and then on to Canaan. Uh, on the other hand, Lot would have been an adult uh, by the time Terah had died and Abram uh, resumed his travel on to Canaan. Uh, so we might assume that Lot decided to tag along, if you will, and Abram allowed him to do so. Uh, we're going to see in a few chapters, however, that Abram's decision to allow Lot to accompany him uh, has some long-lasting consequences. Uh, so hindsight being 2020, uh, we wonder if that was a prudent and a wise thing to do. Uh, in verse 4 of chapter 12, uh, we're told that Abram is 75 years old when he leaves uh, Haran uh, after Terah died. Uh, but we also know from chapter 11 that, that, and maybe you've picked up on this in your study, that at that time Terah was 205 years old when he died. Now, I did the math. Uh, if you subtract 75 years, Abram's age when his dad died from Terah's age, uh, which was 205, you get 130 years. Well, back in Genesis 11, verse 26, we're told that Terah was 70 when he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So, this has sort of caused some problems and led many to wonder whether this is a contradiction in Scripture. Uh, and it's not, uh, but rather a matter of, of making a bad assumption. We, we don't have all the moving parts, if you will, at this part. Uh, in, in 1126, we're told that Tabor becomes the father of three sons when he's 70. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Uh, we know that Terah did not have triplets. Uh, these boys were born over a period of time. Abram is listed first, uh, leading many to assume, well, Abram's the oldest. He's the firstborn, uh, thus the contradiction in ages. Uh, in reality, Moses lists the names in order of importance, not birth. So, Abram is first, Nahor is second, Haran is last. And obviously, Haran is last. Why would you think he's last? Because he dies young, out of the way, gone, okay? Since Haran is the first to have a child, it's likely that he was the oldest and Abram was second or even third. Therefore, we know that Abram was born when Terah was 130 years old. So in verse 5, Abram and his group enter Canaan. They've come from Ur to Haran. 
His dad died, the patriarch. Then they start making the journey to Canaan. Abram has obeyed in leaving behind his father's house. This was his father's ancestral home, if you recall, in Haran. But God's command carried a deeper significance for Abram. God was asking Abram to leave behind his father's inheritance. I wrote, whoa, That's, that changes things, doesn't it? Inherited wealth, wealth was essentially land, animals, and servants. God had told Abram to leave that inheritance behind and trust in God for a better inheritance. Well, he must have been second in order because the first son usually got the inheritance, didn't they? Well, he got the double inheritance, remember, in that day. The eldest son got the double. The other sons got something. So but he just got. Died, Aaron must have been the oldest. Most, which is what they said. Most likely he was the oldest. That's right. And so we know Abram was either second or third. Don't know which which order. But but, but here he would there would have been some kind of inheritance. So here we see Abram this early uh, taking an affirmative step of faith. Now think about it. We looked last week about how they worship their gods in Ur in the land that Moses calls the land of the Chaldeans, all right? So when he called Abram and, and his father, it, when they were in Ur, uh, they were not believers mm -hmm. at all. So this is a, 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 a big, big step of faith. Uh, God, even today, continues to ask men and women to serve him by walking away from things they value in the world for the hope of something better uh, in eternity. Uh, think about it. He calls missionaries to leave the comforts of their culture. He calls pastors, teachers, elders, and others to sacrifice free time, uh, to sacrifice sleep, uh, and to serve the, the body of Christ. He calls his children to sacrifice dignity and personal safety to preach the gospel and live as witnesses for his kingdom. He calls all of us to, to sacrifice financially at times to support the work of the ministry. But we we'll see Abram so early in his walk with God uh, just showing amazing faith, which we know he was. We read that through even New Testament scriptures, especially in Hebrews 11. But notice how Abram entered Canaan. He had a family. He had possessions. He had servants. So Abram walked away from his father's estate, but God still ensured they had accumulated provision in Haran. God isn't unconcerned with our needs or unwilling to bless us materially, Scripture tells us. Uh, in Matthew 6, verse 31, this is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus himself says this, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And this is my favorite part. And all these things will be added to you. But our prosperity in this world is not, not, not the Lord's first priority. And he wants to make sure it's not our first priority either. His priority is our dedicated, sacrificial service to him. That's what Abram did. That's the test of obedience and faith. 
Uh, so as Abram enters Canaan, he walks through the land taking stock of it. I was going to see if it's on Pam's map over here. Um, it is. It's, it's tiny over there, but you can see it down uh, where Israel is with the square. And then down below that is, is Shechem and the Negev uh, going into Egypt. So right there above the Red Sea is the area we're sort of uh, talking about here. Um, so, so as, as Abram is walking through the land, uh, trying to sort of assess it, uh, how strange this must have felt, and look to an outsider. Here's Abram, the head of a single family, walking in Canaan, a land occupied for generations by powerful tribes uh, descended from uh, Ham's grandson, and he's surveying the land, you know, almost like its new owner, yet without any visible means of forcing its occupants out. Talk about a walk of faith. To the world, Abram appears as the stranger, the one with no claim to the land. And yet, in truth, Abram was the rightful owner of the land, and the current occupants were the strangers in truth. A strangers, that is, to the promises of God. Now, what's more, Abram pitches his tent, it says there in verse 6, by the oak of Moray, uh, near Shechem. Uh, this is an important place uh, in the history of Israel. Uh, the Hebrew translated oak of Moray uh, can be translated, as you see on the little excerpt from Strong's, as the terebinth of the teacher, uh, which is a reference to a center of pagan teaching. The same place appears frequently in Scripture and is always associated with Israel invading Canaanite idolatry. Uh, so that's what we see here, the Oak of Moray. Uh, it's here that Abram chooses to first pitch his tents. Uh, Abram invades Canaan and by his arrival announces that this land will one day become Israel's and the Messiah's, uh, symbolically shining God's light, uh, penetrating the, the lostness and the darkness of that pagan world. Here's the power of faith and obedience in Abram at work so early in his walk. Uh, our faith uh, has the power to save us as only faith can do. Uh, but as James taught us, if that faith isn't put to work, it's, it's useless. He says it's dead. But when our faith is put into action through obedience to God's call, uh, it, it's just a mighty thing. It's a powerful thing. Uh, it holds the power to penetrate lostness uh, and deliver light, uh, the light of hope uh, in Christ for a lost world today. Uh, our faith has the power to save us. Uh, it's obviously only faith can do. Uh, so Abram was just one family with no hope to take control of the land, he thought, at this point in time. He knew his day to own the land would come along after he died. But in the meantime, he served God's purpose by entering the land and by confronting the Canaanite culture head on. Uh, in a sense, uh, we have the same mission uh, today that was given to Abram. We have a faith, uh, we have a call to serve God uh, who has told us to leave our dependence on the world and what the world offers and walk away from what holds us, what binds us to the world. And then we've been made to share uh, in the promises of Abram. Uh, we have the hope of a future eternal inheritance one we receive after 
our deaths as well. And while we wait, uh, we are being led in our walk of faith to a place God will show us. That's what a walk of faith involves. Not being able to see is what faith is. If I can see it, that's not faith. Uh, we already know what we got. Uh, and the Lord has told us that he is sending us into lostness and darkness. Why? To bring light and truth. And we're not to shrink back from that call. We, we walk confidently and pitch our tents in the heart of paganism and idolatry because that's what ambassadors do. Paul says in Corinthians, what we are ambassadors for Christ. Well, what does an ambassador do? He proclaims the word from his sovereign, from his master. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Paul says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So what we're reading in the Old Testament with Abram, we see confirmed by Paul in the New Testament. You and I, it says, are new creatures made new by faith in Christ's death and resurrection. And the old things of our nature and lifestyle have passed away like Abram's idol-worshiping traditions, his worship of pagan gods, Life uh, is history uh, for us. Uh, and God also has given us this ministry today, uh, this ministry, he says here, of reconciliation, the gospel that reconciles men to God. So Paul tells us we are to be ambassadors, as if God were speaking to the world through us. If you've ever been on a mission trip to a lost country, you probably experienced firsthand what it means to step into the heart of lostness and darkness. But hopefully you also saw the power of God working through his people in the midst of that situation. God is a God of, of new beginnings. And he seems to do his best work in the worst places, doesn't he? But, but we don't have to travel to a third world country or an area like that to be an ambassador for Christ. Myrtle Beach is filled with terabents of paganism and darkness. And we are appointed as the body of Christ to, to break into those places uh, as well. And when we obey, God goes with us. He doesn't ask us to preach necessarily. Uh, notice what Abram did in our text. He just walked and lived in the land is what it says. But it was enough to get people's attention and make God's presence known. All right, let's go back to our text uh, following along with uh, verses 7, 8, and 9 in chapter 12. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. 
Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Now, as Abram obeys, pitches his tent in the land, God appears for the second time. He affirms to Abram, you're in the right place, son. But now God reveals sort of a new detail concerning the inheritance. God will give this land to Abram's descendants. Now Abram begins to understand that the land won't be fully possessed until Abram's descendants receive it. This is likely the point when Abram came to understand that the land was not to be his in his own lifetime. Many have assumed uh, that Abram and his family were always nomadic uh, by tradition. Uh, so they don't think anything of Abram living in tents uh, throughout his time in Canaan. But that thinking um, ignores Abram's history. Where did we say Abram was from? Ur. Ur. What do we know about Ur? Prosperous city. Wall city. Even after he and his father moved <coughs> back to Haywood, <coughs> Abram and his father live in the city, we're told. But since he has left Ur, a land of prosperity, and Haran town, and gone down to Canaan in the Negev, uh, he is seen living in tents. In fact, we know from Scripture that he will live in tents his entire life in the land, which the writer of Hebrews explains uh, as an act of faith. Remember in our verse-by-verse -verse study of Hebrews when the writer tells us in chapter 11, the faith chapter, verse 9, by faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So Abram wasn't a nomad by tradition. That's not the way he was raised. He lived in tents as a matter of faith, according to the New Testament. What a lifestyle change. He lives his faith in God's promises to deliver the land that he's promised at a later point for his descendants, and ultimately a faith that the real inheritance he looked forward to receiving was the eternal one. He understood that. So as Abram sees the Lord appear again in the land, he responds, notice what he did after the Lord appeared? He built an altar. Uh, altar building will become an increasingly important tradition among the patriarchs, uh, Abram just being the first. Uh, as we discussed when Noah built his altar, uh, altars are places of worship. More specifically, they are places of sacrifice. An altar is the table upon which an animal is placed uh, so that its blood may be poured out. It's also the place where an offering uh, is made to God. Patriarchs will build altars when they wish to express worship to Yahweh for his faithfulness and his blessings. And it's here on the, this occasion of God's reiteration of his promise to Abram that Abram does that. He worships with an altar which means he also made sacrifices. Standing in the heart of the Canaanite culture, pagan teaching, a godless society, Abram invades this darkness, this lostness, 
and sets up a testimony to God's forgiveness. And he worships. And notice that Abram repeated its practice uh, as he moved southward through the land. Uh, it says he stopped between Bethel and Ai. Uh, notice Abram purposely camps outside of two cities, uh, remaining between these two towns rather than moving into the city. Clearly, he is going out of his way not to become part of the Canaanite paganism, that culture. Uh, and again, see what he does, he builds an altar to the Lord, calling upon, it says, uh, the name of the Lord. Now, of course, today we don't build altars. In fact, there's a reason you don't see an altar uh, in our church today, uh, nor should you see an altar in any Christian church. Uh, because an altar is what? A, a place of sacrifice. Right. But Christ's sacrifice, according to Scripture of himself, is the one and all sufficient sacrifice and death uh, for the atonement of sin. That's all it takes. Uh, no other sacrifice is required, nor, nor should we imply uh, that one is needed. All because of Jesus' one and only sacrifice uh, at Calvary. Uh, instead, the Word of God tells us how we are to set up altars in our world as Abram did. Uh, it's funny, we looked this morning in our Sunday school class at Romans 12 uh, by Paul and talked about this sacrifice. Here's what he says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So you see the sacrifices we are to make today? Living and holy sacrifices of ourselves, our body, which must be acceptable to God. Now we repeat Abram's example, uh, not by animal sacrifices on stone tables, but by really presenting ourself uh, as a holy sacrifice, living, a living sacrifice. Now, living, as I explained this morning, means uh, it's not dead, which means it is an ongoing situation, right? If you're a living sacrifice day by day by day by day, every day, you are to be a living sacrifice daily in your lifestyle, in your worship, in your praise, in everything you do. That's what we're called to do. Uh, this is spiritual worship. That's what he says there at the end of, of verse 1. And so while Abram proved God's will for his life and the Canaanites' land by hearing from the Lord while living among the Canaanite people, we in turn prove God's will to a lost and a dying world uh, by listening to God's word, allowing it to pierce and penetrate our very hearts, minds, and lives, uh, making us Christ-like so that we may be living sacrifices and represent Christ to a pagan culture out here even in our area, Myrtle Beach. Looking at Abram's testimony now as he begins his walk with God, we see him as a man of faith and obedience. You can really say trust and obey uh, was a sign, a character trait of Abram. Paul says in Romans 4.16 that Abram, uh, Abraham, you see here, his name's not changed yet. He is the father of faith. In James 
2 verse 23, he's called a friend of God after his name is changed to Abraham. He's the patriarch of patriarchs, being the first one. But he's also a man who, as scripture records, messes up big time. He makes serious errors. He shows weaknesses in his faith several times. And as he begins his walk, uh, he was new to faith and unfamiliar to depending upon God. And like anyone new to faith, Abram must progress through these trials and these challenges and this darkness uh, if he is to grow spiritually. Uh, the same way we do. Uh, you've been around a new Christian. If you've been around a new Christian, you know, I love to hear a new Christian pray. All right? <laughs> it's so simple. It's like a child. But, but they make spiritual errors in their walk because they totally are not leaning upon and trusting uh, in the Lord. Uh, so far tonight, Moses has taught us how this new man of faith heard God's call, the first few verses of chapter 12, in her, responded to God's call in obedience and received God's promises of blessing. Abram's receiving of God's promises began the fourth period of God's rule over creation. I, I think there are seven dispensations, if I can remember. Uh, I just got a chart that's got the, the five of them, but there are seven dispensations. Uh, we refer to this period as the, the dispensation of promise. We, we really know it as the age of patriarchs. That's what it is. A dispensation is, is like an age, this particular part of um, our study. It's distinguished from the dispensation of government. If you remember back here, uh, you know, around the flood, after the flood, uh, when they sort of picked one family, uh, and while government still operates, God's purpose will be uniquely fulfilled uh, through the line of one family. And that's why we sort of change courses picking up in chapter 12. And that family, of course, is Abram, uh, which is where the seed line passes. And in the second half of chapter 12, Moses relates one of Abram's early I wrote missteps after arriving in the land. It's a pretty big one, uh, but it is amazing to see God's, not only his patience, but his forgiveness and his continued guidance uh, of his man, Abram. So let's look at those events as we move to verse 10 of chapter 12. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe in the land. Has that ever bothered you, big man, when you studied Abram? Why in the world does he go to Egypt after he leaves his home in Ur and goes to Haran from a pagan society to a belief and then takes his whole family and goes to Canaan, all right, why does he go to Egypt because of a famine? And, and of course, that's the reason. Abram's been wandering through the land to take in all that God has given him and his descendants. His wanderings brought him into the southern part of Canaan, into the Negev down here. This is Egypt over here, okay? Uh, Red Sea is there, so you sort of get your bearings. The Negev is the final wilderness before you reach the border of Egypt, uh, geographically. So as we enter verse 10, Abram, notice he's living near Egypt's border, uh, making his new life in Canaan. Now Moses says here in verse 10, there was a famine in the land. 
This statement holds great intrigue for us, uh, for me too, because we know that famines are not events of chance or luck, right? We know God has brought this famine about. So we must conclude if it's a famine and God has brought it, what does that tell us? What would you call that? A test. A test. We love tests, don't we? No. No. We don't like tests. No, no, no. I'm not going, I'm, I'm skipping the test. I'm opting out of this. Not only on Canaan as a whole, but it's a test on Abram in particular. Mm -hmm. Right? So this begs a big question. Why would God bring such a test upon Abram so soon after leading him into the promised land? History tells us, as we've talked about, that Ur was a prosperous city. As we've discussed, it was located in the fertile Mesopotamia area where the Garden of Eden began where crops and herds were plentiful. Archaeologists have found evidence that the city traded for exotic goods from around Asia and Africa. So Abram's family was probably accustomed to having plenty, all right? land of plenty, we can identify. So then the living God reveals himself to his man Abram, and called him to a better place. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but I'm going to show you, all right? It's a place I've prepared. This is going to be your new inheritance. What do you suppose Abram expected to find in Canaan? I'm, I'm doing all right here. All right? God has called me and promised me this inheritance. If pagan Ur was a prosperous place to live, whew, how could you imagine God's promised land would be? Oh, man, it'd, it'd be over the top, wouldn't it? Right? Offering a much easier life. With the onset of the famine, Abram must have sort of been scratching his head and wondering, mm, what's gone wrong, hmm. right? Did, did, did he do something wrong? Did God forget his promises? Whatever the cause, Abram knew, I need to take matters in my own hands. I can solve this myself, right? If following God and depending on God for his needs and his inheritance was plan A, all right, then perhaps Abram's thinking, well, I think it's time for plan B. Plan A isn't working very well. It's not providing for me or my family in the manner to which I've grown accustomed and as we heard, Abram's plan B was to follow the world's lead, head to Egypt. Ancient historical records confirm what we see Abram doing here. When famine would hit Palestine hard, many would migrate into Egypt seeking greener pastures. Even when Egypt experienced drought, the Nile River would bring enough flood waters to ensure a good grain harvest. So while the rest of the known world is suffering, Egypt often would become the world's destination for survival. Yeah. Remember the story of Jacob and his sons when Joseph was sent to Egypt what led the sons to go down to Egypt a famine <laughs> all right that's the way God got them down there so these are tests Egypt plays a prominent role in scripture both in the Old Testament and in the New 
Uh, at times, it becomes a place of protection for Israel, uh, as we see in the life of Joseph and his brothers. And at other times, it serves as Israel's oppressor. Uh, after Jesus was born, Egypt, as you know, becomes a place for the Messiah to hide as a child, remember? Two years old, he had to sort of run from Herod. And in the coming kingdom, Isaiah tells us that Egypt will remain an empty wasteland as a testimony against Israel's enemies. We studied that in our verse-by-verse -verse study of Revelation. Uh, by all these examples, Egypt becomes a picture in Scripture of the unbelieving <coughs> Gentile world. Egypt pictures the unbelieving Gentiles, giving Israel sanctuary at times while persecuting them at other times. Uh, Egypt pictures <coughs> the way the world becomes a place for the Messiah to dwell before he comes into his kingdom in the form of his church. And Egypt will one day picture the judgment that comes upon the world of unbelievers uh, who reject uh, the Messiah. So Egypt pictures the sinful, unbelieving world. Abram responds to his time of trial, I, I, I can't even believe this, by retreating to the world. I've got all these promises from God. I'm convinced. I've moved my whole family, my life from this fertile crescent to the desert wilderness out here. Now there's a famine and I've got to leave. He goes to Egypt looking for the provision he expected to find in God's <coughs> land. I, I get that, don't you? What a mistake he makes. Although I understand how he makes it. Because when the rubber meets the road, that really is a test of, of who <coughs> we are. Susan. What was the time that they were there before they left again? Do you have any idea of the time that they spent before they went down to Egypt? Oh, no. What? No, no. You mean when they spent the time in the Negev and uh -huh. all that? No, it doesn't give us that. Okay. No. Okay. But it was long enough for the famine to come and for it to really make an impact. You probably, uh -huh. hopefully, giving him the benefit of the doubt, he uh -huh. hung out for a while saying, I think we can make it. God's going to provide. You know, manna or something. I mean, something's going to happen. Uh, Abram, think about it. He receives no instruction to leave the land of Canaan. He receives instruction to leave Ur. He receives instruction to leave Haran and go to the promised land. No word here. And this time in Egypt, just leads to more stumbles and more compromises. We see his character chipping away a little bit. Abram may be a man of faith, but at this early point, he's a man unaccustomed to living by that faith. Here he faces his first test as a man following God. And he concludes that Reliance on God isn't enough. Not under these circumstances. I, come on now, this is reality. This is a famine. We're going to starve to death. So when we're new in our walk of faith, or, or when we are untested, we have little personal experience in depending upon the Lord. On the other hand, we do have experience in depending upon ourselves. Somebody just told me the other day, then if you want to do this, you got to do it yourself. You can't trust anybody else. If you don't do it yourself, it'll never be done right. And I said, oh my goodness, it's like the devil is sitting up here just saying, here's the way I solve my problems, right? 
Trials are a God-provided opportunity for us to learn what depending on God looks like with skin on it. Early in our walk, we're likely to revert under pressure to what we know best. If I don't look after me, nobody's going to look after me, right? Which is actually a lie, if you think about it. Even when we are living apart from the promises of God, dead in our sins, uh, we're still dependent on God for every breath, right? Uh, we just didn't recognize and acknowledge his role. I mean, you ever, what was it? The preacher was talking this morning. You ever count your breaths? There's one. There's another one. Wow, there's another one. That's just sort of automatic. Look at this. It's just, wow, this is pretty good. Him. We forget that role, right? We, we just don't acknowledge his role. So I'm encouraged when I read that Abram, the father of faith, according to New Testament, had days when his faith didn't drive his decision making. Instead, he doubts. Uh, he fears, and his sinful nature, which is an aid in every one of us, drives his decision-making. And his mistakes certainly don't justify our mistakes. Right. But they remind us that walking in faith is a progression in maturity, not an instantaneous achievement. No. I've arrived. No, now comes the test. And the engine driving our maturity is the Holy Spirit bringing the truth of God's word to our heart. You, you can trust him. Now, the evil one, the, the prince of this world, the little G God, uh, hates you. He's going to do everything he can to steal your joy and steal your trust and your faith. And the fuel for this engine of maturity uh, are trials and tests brought about by the Lord. Yeah. Isn't that what James tells us? <coughs> James 1? The testing of your faith? That's what it's about. He's going to test you. We have tests in school to sort of see how we're doing. And, and we don't like tests. <laughs> we, we're pathetic at tests. Uh, James, a half-brother of Jesus, wrote this to the church. Chapter 1, I love this passage. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. You notice it didn't say if, when. When you run into these Abram kind of tests, just consider that a blessing, joy. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Folks, we got it all in the book. He tells us all of this. We just forget these other parts because where the rubber meets the road, I got to do something now, right now, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, we are to face our trials joyfully in the sense that we recognize their potential to achieve a good purpose. I'm giving you this test not to harm you, but to test your faith, your walk. You have to depend upon me, not on yourself. Because these trials are how we learn to endure in the faith. Right? I mean, have you ever met somebody who you would call were born with a silver spoon in their mouth? And then all of a sudden, after 30, 35, 40 years, something happens. They lose all of their material possessions. And what happens? I mean, if they don't do something like commit suicide, they, they just they, they do crazy stuff. <clears throat> they turn to a world of sin. They turn to the world. That's what they do. Yeah. In, instead of relying upon the Lord who might be putting them through a test. Yeah. But he says here, in order to attain to the perfect or complete work in faith, I'm going to test you. Isn't this Abram's shortcoming here? Yeah. He didn't understand. Yes, John. 
You have Abram here just following the world because he's not the only one going to Egypt. That's, it, that's right. Yeah. It, he, he's, he's following the Going crowd. with the crowd, right? Right. That's what our children used to say. Well, so and so is doing it. <laughs> and that must, that must make it okay, right? right? So that's Abram's problem. He didn't understand that he could be complete in the Lord, finding the Lord's provision lacking here. That is, it's just not as fulfilling, it's not as satisfying as what's going to happen to us in Egypt. Right? Things going to be good down there. It's greener on the other side. This is the early experience I believe the Lord gives every new believer to understand that walking in faith is not a recipe for more of what the world offers. Sadly, many believers are taught that their entrance into faith means they've arrived. They've, they're on easy street now. They're going to have it made. We're going to be rich. We're going to be popular. We're going to be thin. <laughs> right? They'll find life's problems disappearing and all their dreams coming true. Wow. Wow. I wrote down here, eh, wrong. <laughs> None of this is true. None of it. It's a lie from the adversary. God's word teaches us that just as the prophets were persecuted and as our Lord was crucified, so will God's children be mistreated and persecuted. Uh, the Lord said that we should expect didn't he, in the New Testament, to be hated by the world for his namesake. The reality is that the world appeals to our flesh, but a walk of faith depends upon our spirit. And as Paul teaches in Galatians 5, uh, we are either led by our flesh or we are led by God's spirit. We can't follow both. They're at opposite ends. Uh, look here in verse 17 of Galatians 5. For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. Uh -huh. That's a pretty smart part. I like. I don't remember that word. They must have added that one in, right? <laughs> wow. I, I don't think it's any coincidence that Abram had ventured close to the Egyptian border by the time of the famine. I, I don't know. I looked at that map, and he came all the way down through Canaan, all the way down to the Mount to Shechem. All he had to do was just jump across the border. I, I, I don't know. I, that's not scriptural. That's just gut feeling. Here we go. See, you see it. Knowing that Egypt is a picture of worldliness, uh, then we might see Abram's choice to live in the Negev uh, as a picture of trying to hold on to the world, uh, but walking with God. You know, you sort of got one, one foot in, in both sides here which is what we do. And then when the trial came, uh, it's much easier for Abram to step across the border and go into Egypt because things look better over there. Christians repeat this error when we entertain thoughts of uh, remaining married to the world, right? We're talking about the Christian who lives with one foot still in the world while clinging to the life the Lord calls them to leave behind. When Jesus prayed to the Father, remember before his death on the cross, li listen to what he says concerning God's children. That is, those who have faith, all right? John 17, this is Christ's prayer before going to the cross. Jesus himself says this, 
and I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also might be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. Here's where we come in. But for those also who believe in me through their word, that they might all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. We're in the world. We're not to be of the world, right? Abram didn't have this. New Testament verse. Jesus hadn't been born. He couldn't go back and read this, all right? His was unseen. This hope of having this conversation, this calling with God. Jesus says that God's children are like Christ in that we are spiritually different in the world. And that difference, folks, will cause the world to disapprove and distance itself from us in just all kind of ways. And yet Jesus says he would not ask the Father to remove us from the world, not until the time God has appointed. Instead, you see what he says, he asked the Father to keep us from the enemy, to sanctify us. In the truth of God's word. What does sanctify mean? Anybody remember? Set apart. apart, Holy. A different lifestyle. I'm sanctified in Jesus Christ. My walk is different and separate. Just as the Father sent the Son into the world, so we are sent in Christ's place until his return to rule. And, And that we might act and think the way God thinks, uh, living this sanctified, set apart, glorified, godly life. But if we live with one foot in the world, sort of longing for what the world has to offer, uh, we retreat from sanctification, from holiness. We, we too, we crossed the border into Egypt. Well, this sure looks better over there, doesn't it? Yeah. Seeking association with the world, seeking the world's approval. You know, it matters what people think about us, right? What the world thinks. Well, I I don't want to upset them. I don't want to say anything bad. (laughs) Instead of relying on the blessings that come exclusively because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Our faith does bring great blessings, but like Abram's inheritance, those blessings await the appearance of the kingdom at the return of Messiah. I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly, Jesus says in John 10, right? Here, now, are you living the abundant life? That's the promise he's really giving to Abram. In the meantime, uh, we live in the enemy's world, But we're told by our Lord uh, that we no longer live as if we are part of the enemy's world. In the world, not of the world. We aren't to think like the world. Uh, We're to seek. We're not to seek what the world seeks. Uh, We're not to love like the world loves. Uh, We're not to live like the world lives. All of that is a test of our faith. Day by day by day, a new test. Abram failed this second test of faith. And he stumbled because he was still clinging to the false security of the world. Can't you just hear him? Man, I look at what I left in earth. Oh my 
goodness. And here I am in a wilderness living in a tent, and now there's a famine. <clears throat> Plan B, right? Clinging to the false security of the world rather than remaining where God had delivered him, trusting in God to provide, despite the famine, Abram walked according to his own counsel. Isn't that what we do? I had somebody come up to me the other day and they said uh, that they're doing an estate plan. And they said, Mr. Welch, how much is enough? I said, just a little more. That's what I'm always heard. <laughs> and, and I quickly corrected that. I said, enough for what? And we talked about, are you a Christian? I am. You go to church? I do. You believe in Jesus Christ? I do. He's enough. You don't need any more. He's got it. I mean, if he has arranged for our salvation, all right, for our eternity, don't you think he can handle 70 or 80 or 90 plus years? What does Romans say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Come on, Abram, right? All right, in verse 10 of chapter 12, Moses says Abram sojourned in Egypt. I said, sojourn. I wonder why he put that word in there. Because the Hebrew word for sojourn here, you see it is gur. G-U-W-R. Meaning temporary dwelling. Abram knew the trip south was temporary. I'm going to venture into Egypt, you know, just a little while, long enough to get through the rough patch with the famine. Like we might say to ourselves during a trial. We might know the Lord is asking us to wait on him. Isaiah says that, those who wait on the Lord, to rely on him. The preacher this morning said, trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. But we sort of tell ourselves, you know, I appreciate it, but I know how to solve this problem on my own. I got it. You go over there and help somebody else today, right? So we just step outside the Lord's will just for a time, temporary, just sojourn, all right? Short time, seek the worldly option for a little while until everything is okay, then we'll go back in and out of the world. But when we begin to play by the world's <coughs> rules, <coughs> all kind of stuff happens. We mess, up. We, we mess up. It's hard to know where to draw the line. And Abram's experience here, he, he sort of gets on this slippery slope firsthand while in Egypt. Picking up verse 11. We, we hear how Abram seeks the world's solutions of what he perceives as a potential problem. Now, now, it's not enough that it's a famine and he's leaving the country, all right, and God hadn't told him to go. It came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they'll kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. Don't you like that? Whoa, that's what I wrote. Whoa, I could see me asking Beverly to do that. <laughs> No, no way. <laughs> Abram makes this bold request of his wife, Sarah, beginning the way every smart husband begins when he wants something. Notice what he said. Have I told you lately how nice looking you are? Man, you are a beautiful woman, right? Or as the King James Version says, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. <laughs> In truth, Abram's concern was not driven by Sarah's beauty, was it? But his own skin. Yeah. 
I'm sure she was a beautiful woman. Scripture doesn't throw these words out there. And when she talks about a very beautiful woman or a beautiful, she was, you know, Miss Palestine or Miss Nagel or something, Miss Shechem, something like that, all right? Adam, a Abram's fear was driven by what the commentaries say is a well-known cultural practice common uh, to Abram and, and his people and, and some Egyptian noblemen. Uh, that is, during this period of history, Egyptians were infamous for wife abduction. In fact, ancient records discovered written in the Nuzi tablets uh, record this practice. Uh, when Egyptians came upon a husband with a beautiful or a desirable wife, the husband might be killed, uh, the woman stolen and sold as a wife to someone else. And the prettier the woman, the more likely the theft became. On the other hand, if the woman was unmarried, uh, it was more likely that those wishing to take her would barter for her instead of stealing her. So Abram asked that Sarah lie and say, tell him I'm your brother, not your husband. Even though Sarah was Abram's half-sister. And I sent you all out that email last week from Genesis 20. Uh, yeah. that, that talked about all of this. Okay, how how is Sarah uh, his half sister? Because Terah was her father, but but her mother was different than Abram's. Uh, so this is a half truth. All right, it's like a white lie. It's like I tell clients, it's still a lie. You're a liar. All right, if you just take somebody's pencil or pen, you're a Thief, all right? You, you get it? So that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, Abram was likely thinking he might survive long enough to escape during the negotiations and avoid death. Duh. Duh. <laughs> this is God's man? Not very much faith on Abram's part here, is it? God's let him down, and now he's going to be killed because he has a beautiful wife. You, it's just, you see how, where it's going here. That's the way the adversary plays. So where was Sarah in all of this? Why did she agree to play the game? Fine, Abram. The only answer is she trusted God more than she trusted Abram. While Abram might, and in fact does, fail her, God does not. So Sarah remains true to her role to respect and obey her husband. And in this case, she acts according to his direction, even though she's sinning. Will God come to her rescue when Abram lets her down? Abram's fear of death and dependency on the world caused him to live a lie and to bring his wife down with him. This is the inevitable course when we try to live with one foot in the world and the other foot in Christ. Yeah. Yes. And also, he's being ruled by fear. Sure he is. And if we, get, if we have that same problem, we're going to move towards the world and its answers. Sure. Yeah. We do that in sickness. We do that financially. We do that relationally. We do that with all kind of problems, don't we? Fear dominates. And what does the New Testament say? This spirit of fear is not from God. He gives us power. It's what he gives us. Yeah. And Timothy, right? So what happens is, first, if you look at Abram, he goes all the way down and lives near Egypt. Things go bad. He crosses over into Egypt. No word from God. And now he's living a lie. 
to save himself. Paul tells us that when we seek unity with the world, we won't find common ground, nor should we expect to, with God. They're as far apart as the east is from the west. Continuing our text, let's move forward and get this done. Verse 14. It came about when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman, now they've added to it, was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Therefore, he treated Abram well for her sake. See, he was right. Doing this for me, you know and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. Wow. In short, Abram's plan didn't work exactly as he intended. Though his lie saved his life, uh, it produced a new outcome Abram didn't anticipate. The Egyptians had taken notice of Sarah and her beauty was so great it made its way all the way to Pharaoh. And before Abram knew it, Sarah was sitting in Pharaoh's house. <laughs> and because they fought, right, Abram was just Sarah's brother, right? they assured him that he would be treated well because of her. <clears throat> Notice the irony here. <laughs> Abram tells Sarah to lie so he could be treated well because of her. He, he meant he would be able to live and escape with her. Yet in the end, Scripture records the same phrase in describing how Abram collects this wealth from the sale of his sister. Because that's what it was, right? There are seven categories of material that Abram receives suggesting that the Lord was at work in blessing Abram despite his sinfulness. And yet we'll learn that one of the female servants Abram receives from Pharaoh, you know who it was? Hagar. Hagar. I, I, I wrote, uh-oh. <laughs> Did you know that? Did you know this is how he got Hagar? Oh my goodness. Abram's sin in Egypt sows the seed of his own future turmoil and conflict, you know, as well as what we see in the world today with the Arabs through the line of Ishmael. Yes, ma'am. Did Sarah marry Pharaoh? Did the Pharaoh marry Sarah? No, she did not. Well, was she one of his... No, she, God, don't you remember? God protected. I can't remember. We're going we to see that, okay? <laughs> okay. Let, let's go ahead, let's go ahead. Uh, because the Lord's not done with Pharaoh here, okay? Nor with his sin. You sort of see what, what happens here, okay? But the Lord struck Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. But it says that he took her for his wife. Well, he brought her into the chambers. But look, look, Pharaoh, you see what it says there? The Lord struck Pharaoh. The Pharaoh seems to be a victim here in light of the fact that he knew nothing of the deception. He, he pays for his bride, but God has made promises to Abram that depend on Sarah remaining Abram's wife, the seed line. And as Paul says in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. 
So God acts to preserve his promise. Since God has said that those who are against Abram would be cursed, here we see that statement proving true with God working to defend Abram from his enemies. And we also notice God acts to protect Sarah as she obediently obeys and respects her husband even as he makes serious mistakes. <clears throat> the Jewish rabbi Rashi declared that the plague was a skin disease that made sexual intercourse impossible, thus protecting Sarah. And yet the disease did not affect Sarah, thus leading Pharaoh to discern She's the key here. We're all sick, gets the disease, she's okay, something's up. This led to the conversation with Abram. Pharaoh chastises Abram for lying and causing all this trouble. Of course, Pharaoh uh, doesn't say that had Abram told him the truth, uh, he, he wouldn't have abducted his wife and killed him. That's sort of left out. Still, however, that doesn't justify Abram's lie. He stepped into the ungodly world, lied, and had to play by their rules, bringing one compromise after another. Yet even though Abram was faithless, God was faithful to his promise. He protected Abraham and gave him a blessing, but he also protected Sarah from sleeping with the Pharaoh. I mean, they all got diseases. Clearly, the covenant is working and in force. Clearly, the covenant is unconditional, wouldn't you say? Without right. dependence on Abram's behavior. God will protect his plan even when his people complicate it with deception. Consequently, believers should not try to deliver themselves from threatening situations by deceptive schemes, trust and obey him. I got it. I got your back. I can do this if you will let me do this. Wonder why we don't. So as we end chapter 12, note this is the first fulfillment of God's promise to bless those who bless Abram. Remember that's what he said? Those that, that bless you will be blessed. Those that curse you will be cursed. And, and that's what we're going to start seeing. Next week, we move into what's called the Lot narratives. Uh, things continue to go downhill, folks. Genesis 13 and 14. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Uh, how exciting it is just to dig in your word and enjoy what we're reading and to... Uh, sort of transpose it into modern society so we can identify sitting here uh, in January of 2021. Uh, Lord, we, we just love and hunger for more and more of you and your word. Uh, we seek your face, a fresh encounter with you, and ask you just to speak to us and help us to be bolder and more effective uh, God-honoring men and women, members of the, the body of faith, members of the body of Christ as we shine our lights in a lost and dark world. Help us to remain pure. Help us to remain faithful. Help us to simply trust and obey. And it's all in the name of your Son, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.